a bad deal dealt with a very weak hand or a stealth victory for Democrats. The verdicts are just coming in on the president's tax deal with Republicans, and even at The Nation magazine, they're all over the map. Some commentators are emphasizing the sellout of a signature pledge, while others are playing up the hidden gains for low- and middle-class Americans. Will the base come buzzing back when they realize it could have been worse, or is the deal even as bad as it looks? To give their take on deals done and not done, like Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the Dream Act, Richard Kim, senior editor, and Betsy Reed, executive editor of The Nation, join me next. They're co-editors of Going Rouge, Sarah Palin, an American nightmare. I can only tell you that my economic analysis is that given all the alternatives that I can imagine actually becoming law, this is the best economic result for America. And I think it is enormous relief for America to think that both parties might vote for something, anything. I think the one thing that has always happens when you have divided government is that people no longer see principled compromise as weakness. This system was set up to promote principled compromise. It is an ethical thing to do. It, in, a, in a democracy where no one is a dictator, we would all be at each other's throats all the time, and we would be in a state of constant paralysis if once power is divided, there is no compromise. What's the that was the scene on Friday, Betsy. I mean, a lot of people were talking about the 1994 triangulation moment of Bill Clinton, but they didn't have to just remember him. They could actually see him right there with the president at the press conference. The president left early. He left himself. He stayed there right at the podium talking about compromise. This was the question of the week. What do you make of the theatrics first? Well, I mean, I think in, on one level, it obviously made sense to bring in Bill Clinton at this moment because he, I mean, he was a master of triangulation, but he also presided over a prosperous economy. And I think Americans remember that. They, and that's one thing that they do associate with Democrats. And I think there is a way in which they remember that the, this recession was a result of the disastrous economy of the Bush years. Um, but, you know, I also think that it's a shame that the, in this moment um, and, and under the Obama administration, people may have sort of lost sight of the fact that there is a real difference, supposedly, on, on economic issues between Democrats and Republicans. And that's why I think it is important that Democrats are putting up somewhat of a fight. They're not happy with this deal because they because one of the, the main arguments they can make as a party is that they are against tax cuts for the rich. They are against policies that systematically favor the rich. And wasn't it true that so many of the concessions of the Clinton era really created a sham of a great economy that wasn't great for everyone and brought us right here? I mean, there was undoubtedly a, a huge debt-driven bubble in the Clinton economy, and, and that is what, what brought us here. Look, on the tax deal, I think it's totally rotten. I think it's the best rotten deal that Democrats could have gotten. 13-month uh, extension of unemployment insurance, you don't have to go fight that um, every three months like we've been doing. Uh, the payroll tax uh, holiday is, is some amount of stimulus. All of this is not as good, obviously, as getting rid of the tax cuts for the wealthy and doing direct stimulus in public infrastructure investment, all of that stuff. The votes aren't there for that. And I do think we have an incredibly conservative Congress. Not the one coming into power in January, but the one we have right now is an incredibly conservative Congress. And progressives really need to bear that in mind when they start whining about a better deal they could have gotten. Well, but in the nation pages this week, you've got Chris Hayes saying this has devastating political impact, meaning party impact on the base, selling out a signature pledge of the campaign uh, on the Obama side. You've also on the economic pages got Bill Greider saying, well, and the tax, the payroll cut of Social Security taxes could actually threaten Social Security, a critical Democratic program. Richard. Look, I think also letting all the Bush tax cuts expire, um, having middle and working class people's taxes go up, and then producing a double dip recession is the worst disaster for the Democratic Party. So we're all in triage mode here. You know, these are all bad options, but I do think that keeping the tax cuts for the middle class and conceding uh, with the Republicans that you had to also do that for the rich, nobody likes that, um, was the best rotten deal we're going to get. All right, what do you think, Betsy? Agree? Well, I wasn't in the room. I can't say exactly, you know, whether we could have, uh, the Democrats could have gotten a better deal. I think it had this, this 
ta a more progressive tax system been a fundamental goal of the Obama administration from a year ago? I think we could have gotten a better deal. I think they could have made different procedural decisions so that they could use that they could have used the reconciliation process to get this budget through, so they wouldn't need to rely on on you know so many Republican votes and and centrist Democrats. I mean, I think there are, are, are all sorts of ways that Obama and the Democrats could have made this a priority a long time ago. I, th I think you're right there, you know, and, and um, it, it is during the campaign, it was his signature class campaign promise. You know, we're going to get rid of these tax cuts for the wealthy. And, you know, I was there in Denver where the entire stadium sort of lit up because of that. And I do think that was a rallying cry, particularly for the, for the working class. Um, they abandoned that pretty, pretty early. Um, and so given the sort of politics that we entered in after the midterms, you know, this, this is the deal I think that they were capable of getting. I also worry that by saying we didn't have the vote, so we had to roll over basically on this issue. I mean, now we're looking at an even worse scenario. So when we don't have the votes next time around, what does that mean? What kind of compromise is that going to entail? Where, where are we going to draw the line ultimately? I mean, that's what Paul Krugman was writing about on Friday. It's like, what is going to be different a year from now or two years from now when you see a lot of the good stuff in this package expire, but right. the possibility very strongly that the tax cuts for the super rich, and we mean super, super rich when we're talking about the estate tax, um, become permanent. What's going to change, particularly if the Democrats aren't doing the job and the leading Democrat with the biggest bully pulpit is not doing the job of education that Betsy's talking about? You know, in a lot of ways, I, I think progressives are uh, mistaken to ever assume that Obama is going to be the center of resistance against the right. That's just not his temperament. It's not what he ran on, really. It's not um, how he views the presidency. So things like what Bernie Sanders did, I totally applaud. And I think the Democrats in the Senate and the House need to form and, and outside and progressives outside the system need to really construct their own center of resistance to the Republican Party and not rely so much on Obama to use the bully pulpit because he's just not going to step up to that plate. Let's hear some of the discussion over this Sunday. Um, here's Harold Ford to begin, representing Democrats. Take a look. The president, for the first time in the eyes of many Americans, particularly independents who voted for him, he said, you know what, we're going to strike a deal. I got everything I wanted. I don't know of anything in this tax deal that we didn't get as Democrats that we wanted. And what did he do? He extended the cuts for the top earners. Now, remember, we lost an election. If we had gained 60 seats, then what you're saying, you wouldn't have to be here. Now, I'm playing Harold Ford because they didn't play Bernie Sanders. I mean, interestingly, Bernie Sanders' eight-and-a-half-hour speech didn't really make it into the Sunday shows. A lot of people are questioning what was the import of what he said, meaning what's the effect, um, particularly when how Ford is increasingly seen on those Sunday programs as kind of the reasonable, grown-up, democratic voice. Betsy. Well, I mean, Did I Sanders think that's not... Anything? That's not I, well, I mean, I think he did. I mean, first of all, we have a somewhat more democratic media system now so that you can go and see. A lot of people have watched Sanders online. He's been an inspiration. And he's at, he actually made the case um, from a progressive standpoint against these, these, cut, these tax cuts, which, I mean, I just think that whatever, you know, it, it, it turns out in terms of what, what, what could have been possible versus what we got, I think actually having this argument is really important. And for Democrats, and I mean, Bernie Sanders is actually an independent. He's a socialist. To, you know, be part of this conversation is a really good thing. How do progressive or liberal initiatives or any of the other presidential pledges actually get implemented at this point? I mean, we're looking at the DREAM Act, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, is there any strategy that will work for Democrats to keep their voters in line for 2012? Well, you know, we did a package in The Nation magazine uh, about uh, resetting politics now after these losses. And I think every movement from immigration to the environment to the gay rights movement is really having to go back to the drawing board and, and realize that the bargain they made with Democrats in Congress didn't really pan out the way they thought it would. Um, and you know, I don't know this. I don't think there's a sort of you know one answer for all progressives. I think every movement is sort of recalibrating now. But uh, across the board, I think there is there is some sense that you have to go to the outside and, and that whatever is going to happen in Washington is is pretty much going to be locked down for the next two years. Here's Barack Obama talking about health care reform or drawing that parallel. We just heard that the Virginia court has indeed declared the mandates for coverage unconstitutional. So this could be going to the Supreme Court. Take a look. So this notion that somehow um, 
you know, we are willing to compromise too much. Uh, it reminds me of the debate that we had during health care. Th th this is the public option debate all over again. And we will be able to feel good about ourselves and sanctimonious about how pure our intentions are and how tough we are. And in the meantime, the American people are still seeing themselves not able to get health insurance because of pre-existing condition. So he's saying we're having the health care debate all over again. That was part of his attack on his critics from the left from Tuesday of last week. Um, but we may actually have the health care debate at least a little bit all over again. Betsy. Yeah, what I'm particularly concerned about is the, um, the, the empowered state of the anti-choice um, movement, particularly in the House, and how they're really going to take aim at the, the, the very weak provisions of this bill. Um, already there's, there's this requirement that you have to write separate checks to get abortion coverage. They're going to they're gonna use the abortion issue to try to you know, pass something that would repeal that aspect of the law. And I think that the, the sort of um, speculation is that they wouldn't have the votes for a full repeal. But, um, but sadly, in this midterm, we lost 45 seats for you know, pro-choice pro votes, 45. And we already saw how weak we were yeah. last time around during the health care debate when the whole Stupak Pit Pitts Amendment came up. So um, I really think that, you know, as Richard was saying, for feminists, for choice activists, we really need to get down to sort of brass tacks as a movement and think about grassroots organizing, building support from the, for the long term for our position because it's really been eroded in Washington. With respect to the right, you two co-edited the Going Rouge book. Um, is it possible the right could overreach backlash possibilities here, maybe? I mean, that's always a possibility, <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of Sarah Palin sort of, uh, you know, taking the, the Republican mantle, running with it, it, fills, I think, Democrats with some optimism, actually, that, that she's sort of the best candidate. I would say, you know, sort of beware. Um, because you might actually see her in the White House, and that's a genuinely scary thought. Betsy? Well, I mean, I think it's, it is sort of amusing to watch these sort of inter-party schisms among Republicans, and Boehner having to sort of play the grown-up and keep his, you know, the rowdy Tea Partiers in line. So that's something that may, may be slightly weakening for Republicans, but what's disturbing is that Boehner himself is like a total right-wing ideologue, you know? I don't know I how mean, much of a grown-up did he cry three times or four well, times this week on 60 Minutes? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's possible that they could embarrass themselves with a, with a lot of frivolous investigations that clearly don't go anywhere. Um, but, I mean, if that's our best hope, I don't know. Betsy Reed and Richard Kim, you can find their work at The Nation. We'll put a link, thenation.com, at our site. Thank you both. Mm -hmm.